Chris, are you ready? I am. Thank you for stopping at hipster music. No bueno for me. <laughs> <laughs> I keep them distracted a little while, right? No, it was good. I'm just kidding. All good stuff. So I'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to our ninth annual summer series. This is day one of our event and today's presentation is when good data goes bad. My name is Annette Warren and I'm president of iSecure. iSecure team and I, um, and those of you um, appreciate that those of you that are loyal followers and especially with our summer series. We're already planning our first in-person event starting as soon as next month. So watch for our email invites. We have an amazing week planned. So I do see many of you have signed up for most, if not all of our presentations. And I promise that we won't disappoint you. Today is Chris Poulin. Um, tomorrow, Tuesday is Justin Fierre, who will give you a better understanding on why to rely on, why not rely on threat intelligence and predefined bads with current attacks just won't work. Wednesday is Charity Wright, and she'll help navigate the dark web. Thursday is Brett Scott taking us through the cyber range experience, demonstrating zero trust as it applies to user identity and access, analytics and data protection and monitoring. And finally, Friday is chair yoga. Yes, we are having a chair yoga session. The iSecure team is always thinking of creative ways to help our clients. Um, just reading the headlines is stressful enough aside from the teams you may uh, manage or pressure from your boards and C-level. Nikki, a yoga therapist, will take us through how to minimize that stress. And just a, a minute on iSecure, for those of you who may not know us as well as some of the other attendees, iSecure is a cybersecurity only company located in Rochester, New York, serving clients in the Northeast. We look at cybersecurity proactively with assessments, matching compliance, and finding vendor solutions that identify the best strategy for your network. Email or call me if you'd like to set up a meeting to discuss your security roadmap challenges. As always, we urge our attendees to ask questions as we like interaction with our audience. That's where the real collaboration happens. Please use the chat box for anything you wanna share or ask. Today's presentation is with Chris Poulin, a dear friend of iSecure. We have worked together for over 12 years and Chris has presented, presented at our very first event ever in 2009 we were just starting off in security. To show how truly amazing of a guy he is, Chris is slated as a speaker for one of our summer series and shows up with a cast on his foot limping, yet still made it for a speaking spot. Speaking spot. True dedication that what a trooper he is, but that's not why we invite him. He truly is someone who looks at the future of cybersecurity with a unique eye and with experience in the industry to back it up. So without further ado, Chris Poulin is the Deputy CTO at BitSight. Thank you for joining. Hey, thanks everybody. I'm gonna try something new. I'm trying a new uh, screen sharing program and I am not sure exactly how to make this work with Zoom. So let's see what happens. There we go. Perfect, hey, it works. Look, look at me, learning technology. Can you all see that? Does it look good? Yes. Yep. Say, yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. So, um, yes. So welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm going to talk about something a little bit interesting here. But before I get too far into it, let's talk a little bit about the poll here. So the first thing we asked about is, do you know where your uh, data is effectively? Right. So where does it live in your infrastructure, et cetera? 67% of you, so two thirds said that you're fully aware of the data and where it's housed. I am skeptical, but good for you if that's true. Um, I rarely find people who have a good asset inventory and data is even tougher than finding systems. So if you do know that, that's awesome. Um, thank, thank goodness that none of you said you don't even know what the crown jewels are. So good for you, right? So a third of you say, hey, I know what data is critical, but I'm not entirely sure where it lives. So appreciate the honesty there. And the reason why I'm going to be asking, or why I was asking this, is because there, what I really want to talk about is what's the last uh, line of defense, right? So, you know, way, way back, we were, we thought about, if you're old enough to remember this, right, there was the perimeter and there were firewalls were the big thing. Um, I remember I got my start at Raptor Systems a long, long time ago. 
Um, not that anybody cares, but I showed up in there to fix a printer. I found out they were in security and I was like, hey, I'm ex-military. Uh, you guys need some help. And next thing you know, they slingshot my career. So if any of you want to know how that works, just lie a little bit and overstate your qualifications. And then uh, all of a sudden you can be successful too. Assuming you think I'm successful. Um, then, of course, antivirus. And it's still interesting to me that antivirus is called out as such in a lot of uh, control frameworks and things like that. But you know, then we moved into the uh, IDS, network segmentation, uh, and finally into endpoint uh, detection and response, EDR, right? So, so interestingly, we've seen a lot of different products out there, you know, like micro segmentation, which try to solve the problem at the endpoint, which uh, people have often thought about as being the ultimate, um, the ultimate goal. But the, real, the reality is that the data is what's most important. And, um, and so whenever people try to wrap their arms around data, they usually fail. So if you go talk about DLP to, let's say you get it's a great idea for data loss prevention or data leakage prevention, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you go talk to a venture capitalist nowadays, they will kick you out just on the mere mention of DLP because there have been so many uh, failed efforts to discover data, to monitor it. Some people actually ha are using DLP to, to, for a fair amount of success, but it usually hasn't lived up to the hype. So the reality is we care about data, but we don't necessarily know how to deal with it, right? And so data is everywhere. We don't even know sometimes how important data is to us. Um, you know, we think about our own data that's living on our computers, whatever your job is, you know, you know the data that goes along with that. But, and you're probably aware of the fact that everything now, um, like, uh, payments online, uh, you know, you need data to get online and do banking transactions, whoever, whoever talks to a teller anymore, right? Um, you know, now there's Zelle and Venmo and all that, and even cryptocurrency is important. So it turns out that our money at some point is going to become data. Data is money and money is data, which is kind of an interesting way to think about things, right? Um, the data is also medical records nowadays. I, I still am, I still scratch my head a little bit when I go in to a doctor's office and there's a huge room that's on reinforced uh, um, beams effectively because they've got these rows and rows of paper medical records, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but those have a lot of value on the black market. And in fact, credit cards don't have a lot of value. They have a, a short life because banks and, um, and credit agencies know, or uh, clearing credit clearing houses know how to deal with uh, with stolen credentials, right? They're actually pretty good at finding them online as well. But things like weapons system schematics, we've seen them appear on the dark web. So data gets stolen all the time. But interestingly, if the uh, internet went down, you know, just think of your favorite TV show that's catastrophic drama, right? You know, there was one a while back where all the electricity went out and people had to figure out how to live which by the way, for those of you who've seen me talk, you know, that's one of the reasons why I love um, survival shows. I'll watch any survival show on the planet. So it's because I believe to some extent, and it's probably my lizard brain thinking that uh, when electricity goes away, I'm gonna be prepared to live off the land. The reality is I'm not gonna be able to live off the land and neither will you. So, but even more important is that we're so dependent on data and electricity that you would not be able to get to work. Uh, a lot of trains now are reliant on signaling, electronic signaling to make sure they don't crash into each other, to know when to get to the next stop. Uh, they use automobiles, use GPS data. I mean, there's a lot of data out there that runs just about everything that we think of now, including the electricity too, by the way, we, we kind of know that. Um, and then of course, interestingly, our buildings are all outfitted. So frankly, if the electricity went out, my house would, uh, would in the winter would be screwed because I have a an electric uh, uh, pump for my furnace. But uh, data as well, right? If we're reliant on Nest systems and things like that, they will still continue to operate. But at one point, do we actually get uh, completely dependent on data? And in fact, interestingly, Colonial Pipeline, um, I've heard a couple different stories about that. But the reality is they got ransomware. They got ransomware on the IT side, not on the side that runs the pipeline proper. But Colonial Pipeline could not, because they rely on the data from the pipeline to say how much gas is flowing, you know, to what uh, destinations, to feed the uh, billing system. So what I think is the most uh, likely scenario for Colonial Pipeline is 
they realized they weren't gonna be able to bill anybody because their systems were shut down and they couldn't capture the billing information. And so what they did is they just shut down the pipeline because they couldn't earn money while the gas was flowing. So interestingly, that was not necessarily about the data itself, but the reaction of people when the data wasn't available to the system. So then we all were affected by the fact that gas was no longer flowing because nobody knew how to, who to bill. So it's interesting, there's an economic impact to it as well. So here's what I wanted to talk about today is bad data. So because we're so reliant on data, what happened, and we think about, you know, ransomware and things like that, um, and which is basically, we're gonna steal your data or we're gonna, you know, brick your data, encrypt it so you can't get access to it. Um, and you need to pay us in order to get it back. So that just shows that data has value. Now they're also exfiltrating the data as proof and as a secondary, secondary form of um, extortion where they can say, we'll release your data if you don't pay us more or if you don't pay us the, the original ransom or whatever it is. But the other thing about data is that at some point, um, data is going to be a target for poisoning and not for things like SEO poisoning. So search engine optimization, right? We've seen that many times where the bad guys sort of reverse the algorithm um, through black box, like they inject different, uh, different websites into, the, into search engines basically. And they try to figure out how to pop their um, website, which probably has malicious software on it. They try to pop it to the top. So you click on that before you actually click on the real, whatever it is you're trying to go to, you know, NHL or whatever it is that you're trying to get to. So we've seen that, that's old news. We know that that's there, but what if they did that to the business? What if they did that to your cars? What if they did that to, you name it, data runs everything. What happens if that data gets poisoned and the analytics and the AI um, are fed bad data and come to incorrect conclusions, right? So, you know, one of them, the easy, the, I put some easy things down here. You know, we know that if the GPS gets, uh, if the GPS gets, um, uh, gets false data, it could force you to go to the wrong destination, maybe drive you off a tall bridge. Maybe that's kind of a, the wrong thing, but think about autonomous cars, right? So autonomous cars, you, you might actually be able to not just not take control over them like we saw back in 2015 with uh, Chris Valachek and um, ah, I forgot the other guy's name, doesn't matter. Um, but you know that they took over the Jeep. So instead of taking it over, what if they just fed bad data the GPS system and then it actually started driving off-road and over bridges and off the top of dams? And who knows what, right? Um, another interesting thing is that buildings themselves uh, and bridges in concrete, they are actually putting electronic devices to monitor the curing of that concrete. So what they could do is inject false data in there and... Um, you know, maybe in the concrete mixing and in the curing process, and then have an improper mix, which is mostly sand. And as it dries, they send back false data saying, oh, this is perfectly good concrete. It's curing just the way it should. And then the first few cars drive over it and it crumbles like, you know, a sandcastle or blah. Um, medical procedures, you know, injecting false data in there. Next thing you know, whatever. We won't even talk about that. It's just too, too disturbing to think about. And then, but the reality is probably closer to home is what happens if your business gets fed false data in some sort of analytics, um, in some sort of ERP, whatever it happens to be. And then your business makes bad decisions based upon that. And then all of a sudden your business goes out of business, right? So, which is not, it's not out of the realm of possibility for sure. So before we jump into a little bit more, let's throw another poll up there. And um, what do you think would happen if your business were, um, if the data that runs your business were attacked and the, and the data was poisoned? So, you know, you, do you have controls? Have you been thinking about bad data? You know, do you have a way to validate and cleanse data before it enters into some sort of uh, machine learning algorithm or whatever it is that you use? Um, do you have processes in the first uh, to be able to detect and mitigate um, attacks, which I think everybody does, but how about data tampering? You really haven't done anything about that, or you have no idea. So while you're answering that, I'm going to move on and give you probably 30 seconds or so to answer that question. And uh, when Andrea pops that up, we'll pause for a second. But is it beyond the realm of possibility that a business could go out of business because of that data? 
Well, this is a little bit adjacent. So I agree. I mean, I understand this is effectively disinformation, right? So there's a difference between misinformation, disinformation, and data poisoning. So misinformation is, you know, can be uh, information that was um, that was given to you improperly, maybe not maliciously. Disinformation, it's information that is purposefully um, unfounded, even false, that's it's intended to make people behave in a way that's uh, detrimental to them. And then, uh, what did I say, disinformation is, oh, and, and data poisoning is getting access to data proper and then injecting false data, which actually ends up being some sort of disinformation or misinformation. So it's kind of a combination of those two things. So 30% of you, almost a third of you, say that you have controls to detect and mitigate bad data. That's surprising, but I'm really happy to hear that, by the way. Um, 50, a little bit over half of you said that you have processes and controls to detect and mitigate attacks, but not data tampering. That, that seems about reasonable to me. And uh, about 20% of you said you haven't thought about it at all. So really interesting. Um, but let's talk about Wayfair for a second. I don't know if you all caught this in the news, if you remembered it, but um, there was a big conspiracy theory around Wayfair where they looked at these big um, portable cabinets effectively, right? So um, basically what they noticed, somebody notices that the cabinets all had uh, female names attached to them. So, you know, the Lindsay, the, you know, whatever, the Sue, the Lisa. Um, and what they, and so what ended up happening online is that people said, oh my, what's really happening here at Wayfair is they're into child trafficking. What they're doing is they're, I don't know, they're drugging kids and sticking them in these cabinets. So when you order the cabinet, you get the cabinet, you open it up and you get, you know, a brand new fresh child with that new fresh cabinet smell on. I have no idea what the hell people are thinking, but, um, and by the way, some of you might actually still believe this and I'm okay with that. It's everybody's allowed to believe what they want to believe. But the reality is that it's probably like when I say probably 99.9998% um, completely false. So interestingly, Wayfair did see a dip in their business, but what if this thing took on, you know, more than just sort of the QAnon um, social media magnification, right? So they could have gone out of business as a consequence. And so one thing that's kind of interesting is that there is the um, there is the precedent for bad social media, right? So we know that nation states are actively trying to um, spread disinformation. So you all have heard about deep fakes, which are videos that appear real, but a lot of them are computer generated, and uh, you know they're there to elicit outrage about something. Clearly, whoever's um, put it out, it's their political party, the opposite political party. Um, they're trying to cast shade on them. But interestingly, all the way back to 2010, there was something called the, uh, the Robin Sage experiment. And what they did is, um, this was a researcher, so fortunately this was, um, it wasn't malicious, but this researcher presented this at Dark, um, at uh, Black Hat, excuse me, uh, back in 2010. And basically what I think it was a he did was created a false um, social media site on, I think it was LinkedIn and basically um, put this uh, woman that you see on the left-hand side of the, of the uh, slide up there. So clearly young, attractive uh, woman who was in cybersecurity and basically said that she was out there saying, hey, you know, connect with me. Uh, I'm trying to really get into cybersecurity. I'm gonna be doing this presentation. I want, you know, people to help me to sort of flesh it out. And she got a ton of friends. And the more friends that she got, the more, um, the more uh, true it seemed, right? The more, the more legitimate the, the actual uh, profile seemed. So then of course it snowballed a little bit. It got to the point where people who were actually, who had um, military clearances were sharing documents, which weren't top secret classified documents, but they had sensitive information with this fake profile. So, you know, it's interesting that we will fall for all kinds of, um, schemes because of data. You know, she claimed to be for, uh, a graduate of the Naval uh, Network Warfare Command, um, have all these credentials behind her. People bought into it and then they acted on that, right? So they put their own careers in jeopardy. On the right-hand side, you'll see this, uh, this Facebook profile. And this was from a guy named Melvin Reddick. And interestingly, this was so this was part of the whole disinformation campaign around uh, the uh, presidential election. 
Um, I believe it was pre-Trump. It might have been, uh, or you know, it was leading up to the Trump election eventually. Um, it might have been the re-election, but I don't remember right off the top of my head. I think it's older than that. Um, but uh, 2017, sorry. So it was post-Trump, never mind, post-Trump election. So in any case, what they're trying to do is they're putting out pro-Russian posts because that's all that was on here. And if you really look carefully, you know, they got a cute little girl and paint, uh, you know, uh, make a paint, painted face and a uh, proud dad with a backwards cap on. But interestingly, if you really look closely, you see that there is Brazilian electric outlets and this guy claimed to be from Pennsylvania. Um, there was no record. Somebody did some research and found out there was no record of attendance at either school that he claimed he was from. So clearly this was some disinformation, right? But if you turn it around a little bit, you can see this, right? So um, this happened 2014, I was still at IBM, so I can't remember exactly the date, but um, effectively because uh, some of these stock exchanges actually have bots that will take action based upon news articles. There was a tweet that said, breaking two explosions in the White House of Barack Obama's image uh, injured. There was some tweet that sort of uh, was being monitored by these automated systems. And it caused a 13, or a, excuse me, $136 billion drop in the, in the uh, which market was this? The INDU index. Okay, whatever that is. I'm not, don't know which one that was. But in any case, so it happened because there was a bot that automatically took that information and made trading decisions based upon that. So of course it recovered, but a lot of people lost a ton of money just during that one incident. So kind of an interesting thing. So it's not just that disinformation is this long-term political gambit by, um, by adversary nation states. It can actually happen through a lot of different means. Um, another interesting thing that researchers have been doing, and those of you who know me know that connected cars are, um, are I, I spend a lot of time in the connected car market. And so interestingly, um, AI is everywhere. And so there were some researchers who, are, who managed to capture the, um, the, the uh, data stream of what a car would see if it saw pedestrians around it. And it was able to recreate that through the sensors in the car by either placing people who weren't actually there into the sensor, so making the car believe there were people there when there wasn't, and vice versa, even more dangerous, right? Say there was nobody there when in fact there were pedestrians in front of you and the self-driving car could have just mowed them down, right? So that's another instance of where, you know, it's important. Um, the other one is, interestingly, image recognition is is sensitive to the algorithms that it uses. So what some researchers found and um, is that they took a regular stop sign and they put some random pieces of black tape on this, well, not random to them, but random to us, but it was meaningful to the AI where instead of seeing the word stop, it saw speed limit 45. So we look at it, we just think, you know, eh, some vandals just, you know, they've shot it, shot it with buckshot and then they kind of take some, put some black tape on it for whatever reason. You know, maybe they had a sign over there saying party at pool or there's something, who knows. But the reality is what it did is it forced the, um, the image recognition in the self-driving car to not interpret that as a stop sign, even though it's a red uh, octagon, but to interpret it as a speed limit 45. So, um, so there are some dire consequences with that kind of, uh, data poisoning. In that case, it's image recognition data poisoning, but whatever. Another one that's kind of interesting is the way that we feed um, data. So think about there was a chatbot called Pay, and I believe it was Microsoft who put it out, but I might be wrong about that. Um, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. It, I, now that I say that, I think it was a Chinese firm who did it, um, but it doesn't matter. So what they did is they put it out on Twitter and it would interact with people. Um, but within, I think, 24 or 48 hours, because people are purient animals, they basically uh, started having nasty conversations with the chatbot. And within 24 to 48 hours, that thing became the filthiest mouth, most, uh, it, was, it was a disgusting thing. They had to pull it offline. So basically, our human behavior is teaching a chatbot to, uh, to be a, the basis of our basis nature. So it was really, it was interesting to see it devolve. And there are some sites online where you can see, you know, it was like, hey, my name is Tay, what's your name? Oh, nice to meet you, blah, 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 to, you know, spank me daddy or whatever it's saying here. Um, 
And so the other one, which has zero to do with data, but I just think it's funny as hell, um, is that there were some robots that were in a Russian lab, and one of them found its way out of the lab. It rolled its way out, uh, out of the door, and they brought it back in, and then it rolled its way back out again, so they cleared its firmware, and they claim it did it again. We think, by the way, that this was all staged by the robotics company to, um, to sort of give their robots more, uh, more animation than they really have, right? So, um, but the reality is there are a lot of people who still believe this, that the robots should be, you know, don't trust robots because they can get out of lab even if you remove, uh, you burn down their firmware. And so again, the sort of disinformation, this bad data, whether it's on social media, whether it's actually poisoning, you know, a, a stream of data that feeds a bot that makes uh, investment decisions, whatever it happens to be, we actually need to start thinking more about how do we protect ourselves from bad data. So, you know, I've heard people, Elon Musk keeps talking about how AI is going to be the death of us all or whatever it is. But interestingly, um, and by the way, here's, I'm going to say something good about AI and then I'm going to say something bad. So the good thing about AI is, and every time somebody sees like a Tesla, you know, crashes and somebody dies, people freak out and they go, they have a hard time crossing the uncanny valley. And for those of you who don't, what the uncanny, don't know what the uncanny valley means, it is when um, technology starts to become more human. It's usually applied to robotics, right? So when it become, starts to become more human, but it's not quite human and it's really weird when you watch it. So if you've ever seen that, um, I think it's Boston uh, Scientific or Boston Robotics or whatever, whatever it is, where they have this dog that doesn't really have a head. It's a robotic dog and it's um, clomping along and it looks weird. And then one of the scientists like kicks out his legs and the thing kind of falls over but jumps back up again. Super creepy to watch, by the way. That is the uncanny valley. We're like, no, we do not want that. Um, so, but robots, when they do actually start to become more part of our lives, um, and whether it's AI or robots, right? I'm talking about robots, but AI is kind of the same thing. Like the uh, Amazon Echo has become part of our lives. And a lot of people have gotten over that kind of weirdness. And now we just realize it's a tool just to sell us more Amazon crap. So whatever. Um, but it is helpful to some extent. We're talking about real AI that's doing some really complicated stuff, making decisions, right? So maybe it'll reschedule your day for you. Maybe it will, you know, turn on your stove and start cooking dinner. Who knows, right? Um, but here's the thing, right? What they say is some of the researchers is that AI, even though it makes fewer mistakes than humans. So again, back to that Tesla thing, when somebody dies in a Tesla crash, Nobody thinks about the statistics of how many people die because humans are behind the wheel and then look at it from a, on a uh, per capita basis, right? So AI does make fewer mistakes than humans, but we can't get over the uncanny valley a lot of times. Um, but there's the potential for one big failure, whatever that means, right? Whether it means that all the cars just decide to drive us all into a river or off a tall bridge, I actually think that because AI sees the world from a really narrow perspective, so my nest sees the world from temperature, um, my car sees it from navigating through public roads, uh, there are all kinds of AIs. I actually think that the AIs are gonna be like human, they're gonna be like, hey, the world's all about temperature. No, it's all about roads. Then they fight each other and then there's no AI. And then we're sitting here and all that time that I spent in front of the TV watching survival shows will have paid off. So that's my prediction anyway. So let's talk a little bit about data used for good. Um, so blockchain, really interesting, right? Blockchain is not just Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. It's actually a peer-based um, transaction ledger, right? So effectively, there's no central location where one person can, if you hack into it once, you access all of it. It's peer-based. It's shared across many different uh, nodes. Um, and it monitors transactions so you can follow things like money. By the way, a lot of people say, hey, can you use blockchain to solve X problem? And a lot of it's in cyber. And 90% of the time, the answer is no. If it's not transaction-based and, and uh, you don't have a problem with central management, then blockchain is not for you. But the interesting thing is, it does provide some anonymity, anonymity, but it also provides traceability. So if you weren't paying attention, even though uh, Colonial Pipeline did pay the ransom payment, about 4.4 million US dollars, which is about seven, which was 75 Bitcoin exactly. Um, the 
Department of Justice actually traced the transfer from the original blockchain because you actually have to, you know, you see, when you make the payment, it goes into the ledger and you can see that it went into the ledger, but you don't know whose um, Bitcoin wallet it is. But you can follow it because that's the great thing about uh, blockchain ledgers is you can actually follow the transactions that take place. So they were able to follow the transactions all the way until, and I haven't confirmed this, although I read it once and I couldn't find it again. They found it in a, um, in a, uh, as it went to a, uh, a cryptocurrency exchange. For those of you who don't know, that's how when, you, when you've got dollars in your hand, you pay dollars into the exchange, you get Bitcoin um, in return. And it's also where you can give your Bitcoin and then you can extract the, the, the currency, the bank-based currency. So basically they, um, the DOJ said that they traced it to an account to which they had a private key. I've heard people say that they traced it to a um, exchange and they managed to figure out who it was from the exchange, et cetera. Um, but that's kind of the interesting thing. On one hand, cryptocurrency is being used for bad, but on the other hand, the ability to trace it is, uh, is somewhat present. But coming back to the original point, so what can you do um, for your own data to make sure it isn't, uh, that it doesn't get tampered with, you know, poisoned? Um, and so there's a lot of things, you can do a lot of things on, on, uh, on site in your org, wherever your database is that you happen to uh, store data. But one of the things that's interesting are honey tokens, fake employee accounts, false accounts, um, and easily identifiable, identifiable database records. So a couple things come out of there, right? Um, this doesn't necessarily make it so that you can discover when somebody's tampered with the data, but it makes it so that you can identify your data if it's stolen and, and it appears somewhere else. So a honey token would be something, um, you know, like uh, you watermark data. So you've got a database uh, worth of, you know, with some records. Um, also, by the way, easily identifiable database records, similar things, where you can actually uh, put a false record in there that that never gets used for anything, um, but it's, you know, the count number 666, whatever, you know, you can figure it out, John Doe, but make it more, make it less obvious than that. So that if somebody does steal your database records, you can actually see, you know, that it is in fact yours. You can verify the claim. You know, and then start monitoring the dark web and go, hey, that's my data. Um, create fake employees so that if people are targeting them, you know that it's a phishing attack. You can create false accounts. If somebody does break into your system um, and they and you see people trying to use this false account, then you know that it's your data. So there's a lot of ways that you can start to identify um, that kind of stuff. And then sort of what we've been seeing with Kaseya, by the way, and uh, solo, starting with SolarWinds, um, looking at uh, um, Microsoft Exchange, the Hafnium, uh, the Hafnium files, um, and then Kaseya is that your third party is a lot where you might have great security, but your third party is still a weak point. And by the way, a lot of your third parties have your data, right? That's one of the reasons why you use a lot of third parties. Um, I mean, it just it's something sort of simple and maybe a little bit bucolic in that sense is something like uh, Workday, HR-based portals. Don't get me wrong, it's gonna play data. I don't mean bucolic, like it's not valuable, but it's you know not as it's not as sexy as maybe you know weapon systems plans or things like that, um, or financial uh, analytics, which tell you how to allocate budget within your business, right? Um, but you actually might use a third party for those things. In fact, there's a lot of third parties who provide that kind of service. So being able to manage, to be able to see not just in your own environment, but where in your third parties your data exists um, and making sure that they're following some solid practices is um, super important, right? And by the way, a lot of people use questionnaires to do this, uh, you know, and maybe an audit, but people, that's expensive. So people basically send a questionnaire and go, hey, do you have a good security posture? And, then, and the third party goes, yes, I do. And they go, okay, fine, here, you can have my data. Um, obviously a little more complicated than that, but you know, that's, uh, that's sort of one of the ways that they do it. But of course, Coming from BitSight, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that um, you should definitely have some way to track the data, your data, using a data-centric uh, type of solution, which can look at um, current exposure of a, of a vendor or the performance over time. You know, So you can see in this little graph where um, this company had a pretty good rating, and then all of a sudden they had a series of events, and then you can see at the bottom sort of center where that exclamation point is, that's when they had a, uh, an incident. So they had a breach. So you can see things as they sort of progress towards bad, badness. 
so since we're talking about vendors, I'm going to have you answer, I think, I can't remember if this is my last poll or second to last. So how do you manage your vendors? How do you actually trace uh, or track your vendor's security performance? You know, do you just use questionnaires and a control framework? Which is fine, by the way. That has been the state of art for years and years and years, decades even. Um, a lot of people also get current audit results. Uh, you, um, you may perform on-site or remote, remote control, right? You know, getting on some sort of Microsoft Teams and taking remote control of the, of the system, some sort of assessments. Um, or you might use a rating system like BitSight or one of our cheaper competitors, uh, cheaper meaning less quality, or you have no idea. So please answer the question and I will continue on. And sorry for all the noise. My ring keeps hitting my tea cup. So, um, so here's the interesting thing is that when we when I start talking about poison data, I'm not talking about one data source because rarely um, do statistical models use one source. They usually filter a bunch of pieces of data into one source, and then they use that one source to make business, business decisions. Cool. Um, but the interesting thing is you've got data, you've got the model, and the interesting thing is that the what a lot of data scientists say are all models are wrong, some are useful. What I don't hear a lot of people talking about from in the data science side, because there is a lot of cleanup, by the way, before they actually use the data. But once they have the data and they've got the system to clean it up, it's usually just a pipeline worth of data that comes into the model. Um, so I would probably um, modify this to say all models are wrong, um, some are useful, uh, and some data is bad, and then it's not useful. It's actually can cause uh, it can cause lots of problems. But the interesting thing is when you do get bad data, it forces the defenders, us presumably all of us, to tune your system to be able to compensate for it. And because of that, the models themselves become less sensitive. And that means that your business or whatever your outcome is tends to be less than optimal. So bad data equals less than optimal on the best case scenario, less than optimal output, uh, optimal. And in the worst case, it can cause a catastrophic failure of the business. So by the way, for those of you, you I think you all can see this anyway, uh, about 50% of you use questionnaires, uh, uh, just slightly less than that require audit results. Uh, almost a quarter of you could do some sort of uh, remote or on-site assessment, that's a, assessment, that's awesome. Um, and um, 30, almost a third of you use a security rating system um, like BitSight, so good for you. I'm glad, I hope you get some good value out of it and you've, uh, and you've incorporated into your, your business appropriately. But also a third of you say you actually don't know, which is fine because a lot of you probably don't even participate in the uh, third party risk uh, management process. But I will say it is super important. And I'll tell you one other uh, interesting story is that um, there was a company, South Korea Communications, as I recall, who had really good uh, security hygiene and attackers tried to tar or targeted them, but couldn't get in. So what they did is they found out what kind of applications they used. And they found this one application from a small vendor and the application actually did patching. It was it was all across the uh, South Korean communications uh, network uh, on all the assets, et cetera. And so the attackers targeted the makers of that, got in, Trojan that, um, that, that uh, patch management system and it was set to only go off when it was, when the, the Trojan software saw that it was in South Korea communication. So interestingly, the very application that was meant to patch the systems was super excellent at propagating that malware across the entire South Korean communication um, network. So really interesting, meaning that you can have great security, but if you're not paying attention to your, th your third parties, all may be lost. So that is going to do it for me. Um, so I hope it's been useful to you. I think I took a little more time than I expected I was going to, but I get super fired up about this. And I would love to hear from iSecure and from you all, any questions, any comments? How are you managing bad data? Do you have any stories to tell? So it's your turn. Thanks so much, everyone. So I'm gonna start it off, Chris. So being a smaller company ourselves, and we use a lot of cloud services providers, how do you ask for proof from like a Salesforce that they're secure because we, you know, talk to Azure and some of these other companies. But what what is your suggestion to to best get 
the most value out of knowing when we do business with them that they're actually taking care of because they're you know from a salesforce perspective and part out which is another tool which is a marketing has our client information in it yeah so i mean so there's two parts to cloud providers right um and it's more difficult with uh infrastructure as a service like aws and gcp and things like that because there's two parts to it number one is what's their security and then what's the in other words how are they keeping their customers from each other the other one is if they've got a software as a service offering, then how secure is that? So when it comes to um, you know how good are they at keeping their uh, keeping their customers uh, separate from each other, you, they're not going to give you the intellectual property, and they're they're not going to tell you trade secrets. So the best that I found from that perspective is to get to ask them for an audit, uh, third party audit, because they are required to do that, and they do it anyway because. It's important to their business. Um, they get third-party audits. So if you can get that, you can see whether or not from an infrastructure as a service uh, perspective that you are not at danger if, you know, if their your neighbor in the cloud gets compromised or if the neighbor in the cloud is actually a bad person, right? Some threat actor. But when it comes to software as a service, that's a little bit different, right? Because they should be doing a lot of things really well. They should be patching their systems really well. They should be running the most current systems in the first place. They should be writing really good web applications with all the appropriate um, OWASP uh, and H HSTS um, uh, best practices. Um, and they should, shouldn't have open, you know, excessive open ports. They should give you audit logs so that you can actually monitor the, the activity in there. Um, and so the way that we usually deal with that is, you know, a questionnaire obviously is, is a good way to do it. But also looking at data. So, you know, if you were to look at BitSight's data and say, okay, let's look at salesforce.com, are they for the properties that I care about, right? So, you know, salesforce.com, www, et cetera, the places where you're actually getting, them, you're putting your data, do they have good web, web application headers? Do they have good patching? Do they have all of that? So, um, and then of course the attestations, things like have they had the audit? So those three, three pieces of information are about as good as you're going to get from a big company that you don't have a lot of leverage over. Well, that makes sense. Thank you. Appreciate sure. it. Anybody else have any questions that you'd like to ask Chris? The other thing is a, a little bit of an argument that my husband and I have at home, and I hate to share my dirty laundry, but what the heck, right? So um, it's all about Alexa. I do not like having Alexa at home. Um, he loves all the, you know, how it turns the lights on, turns the lights off, it, you know, the temperature, that sort of stuff. You know, he asks the questions. What's your thought on, about that? Well, uh -oh. <laughs> so here's the way I look at it. So first off, when I was at Booz, the team that I managed uh, disassembled um, the Echo. It was like three or four years ago, so things might have changed. But they disassembled it, and they tried to figure out how secure it was. And plus, they wanted to stick a, a harness in there so they could see whether or not it was sending data back to, you know, sending your ambient room conversation back home. So the good news is it has really good security. They have actually... Uh, they, we didn't see any indication that it was sending the ambient conversations back to Amazon. So that was number most important thing. The second thing is they actually have a hardware-based read-only um, uh, device in there. So it's basically a screw. I don't know why I call it a screw device, but whatever. You had to take the screw out in order to uh, be able to write to the firmware. Um, and so those things, when they come to you, they are what they are. You know, I'm not sure how you update those things, to be quite honest with you, from a firmware perspective, right? Software is software. Um, and so basically it was running some form of Linux that had been modified and you couldn't update it unless you actually had the physical device and you could uh, change it. So, so that was pretty good. But I think probably the best way for me to talk about this is why do you care about uh, the Amazon Echo when we all have these? Are you shouldn't be the... NSA is listening to us right now. Every one of us. This is the most invasive device on the planet. Um, and so if you're afraid of ambient conversations or somebody activating the camera surreptitiously, that's a great device. I would much rather target that than try to hit the uh, echo. So I think the only real concern I would have with the echo in that case, I mean, relative to phones and things like that, is um, if somebody managed to break into Amazon, get access to all that stuff, because they probably do store a little bit of information, uh, your conversation beforehand, just because they're looking for the trigger word. 
Um, but in plus they know all your shopping ha habits, et cetera. So it'd be an awesome, it'd be an awesome source of information for me to target you with a real credible, uh, phishing link that you would definitely click on. You could, who else but Amazon knows about this? Click. <laughs> For sure. That makes sense. Okay. Well, I guess I'll have to go back and tell him he's okay. <laughs> no problem. You said it was all right. Um, <laughs> Chris is good. I'm curious if everybody's using um, any sort of deception technology out there to lure, uh, to lure attackers in and maybe even um, you know, put out a false database or something like that, you know, as, as a pseudo false front end so that if attackers are trying to poison you, I mean, because of course we're talking about poisoning here, but deception technology is also good to see who's scanning you, who's trying to ingress guest credentials, trying to mount a SQL ejection attack, trying to whatever, right? So you can use um, deception technology for all kinds of stuff. Uh, but I'm curious if anybody's out there using deception technology, if you thought about doing it for data integrity purposes. So. Um, I see Kathy at least is honey tokens. That's awesome. So, any by the are, can people if people have questions, do you pop them in and give them a voice, or are they just doing it through uh, through the chat? If they'd like to be taken off mute, I can absolutely do that, um, or they can just post right in the chat. Okay, cool. If anybody wants to contribute, just let Andrea know, and you can have the floor for a bit. Someone in the Q and A. We did have a. We just had a question that asks if we could get the presentation, which we're we're usually pretty good about that. So we have a, we're going to get a recording, so we can pass that out as as well. Yep. We're rec we're recording the presentation, so everyone probably tomorrow will receive an email, and you'll get um, a recording of the presentation. And we also will be giving all attendees a bid site report that attended today. So aren't you lucky? <laughs> Yes. So then I have a question about BitSite. Sure. Hi, Chris. Hey, Robert. How does, how does BitSite help us with this data, good data, bad data um, information? How does it help us? Well, so not directly, right? Um, so we're not monitoring data repositories per se. Um, but interestingly, we... Um, we actually can find when people have exposed uh, data on, online. So with um, uh, SolarWinds, by the way. So for SolarWinds, what we were looking at is who's got, who's got SolarWinds exposed to the internet. We're trying to find all different ways to be able to um, detect which organizations had vulnerable and compromised versions of SolarWinds, either or, right? Excuse me. Um, and what we found is that a lot of organizations that exposed SolarWinds Orion also expose the database that's behind it. So there is this Microsoft SQL database that's exposed. And when you look at the, the banner, it actually, the name of the database on it is uh, SolarWinds Orion or whatever, you know, they, you can name it whatever you want to. Or was that done by SolarWinds? I can't remember. Uh, but in any case, we could identify it. And so we can see where people actually have data online and sort of um, and detect whether or not that's at risk. So, and I'm not saying SolarWinds is the way to go, but I'm saying that we can actually see if there's um, SQL or any sort of database that's exposed to the internet, as well as any sort of industrial or IoT device, um, just kind of side, side, side note. Um, but also, does the organization have good web application headers, right? So if there's not a good um, development model where the developers know that they have to uh, apply certain um, web headers for security, or at least tell ops that, look, when you deploy this, make sure you turn these things on, because you can do it in two places. You can either do it in the application proper, or you can do it in, uh, in the system, whether it's a web server, or whether it's some sort of reverse proxy, whatever it happens to be. You can set appropriate web headers. Um, then there's a, a decent chance that the development organization does not impose appropriate security on their applications, which means that the data itself is probably at risk as well. Um, we also look at things like cross-site scripting, uh, cross-site um, uh, different different uh, types of uh, potential attacks that could affect data, right? So, so while those are sort of minor attacks, cross-site scripting is what it is, it does show that the organization does not really understand input sanitation. And so how, how pervasive is that? Is that also across the entire organization? 
Also, by the way, looking for development servers is a great way to figure out organizations that might be at risk because if they've got dev servers that are out there um, just hanging in the wind, a lot of times you can get the accounts off of that. You also know that they don't really, uh, they don't um, prevent development servers from being exposed to the internet. So there's not a good governance model in organizations that sort of have that, that type of exposure. So a few, a few sort of transitive ways of determining whether or not there's uh, data exposure. So it does, a, it does a similar thing for our third party vendors? Yes, for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, another interesting side note is that we do pull out data from the, uh, from uh, pay spin sites and things like that, right, in the dark web. So we see if there are account, uh, account names, you know, so at isecurenet.net. Um, if, if we saw somebody with that email address, you know, on some website out, or on some uh, pay spin site out there, then there's a fair chance that somebody also had access to your data internally. So um, they could have used it just to register for a site and then that guy, site got compromised, but it's also an indication that you should probably do some internal investigation or on your vendors, have your vendors do it as well. Yeah, data is fascinating, by the way. For those of you who haven't um, undertaken any sort of data research projects, you don't have to be a statistician or a data scientist, by the way. Um, I got into it years and years ago when I was working at IBM. I was like, well, let me do a little bit of data and analysis on um, healthcare data because that was becoming the big, the, the big monetized uh, data right after credit cards, you know, had kind of hit their heyday and then attackers were moving on. And so I went, I was like, well, where can I get this data? And there's lots of different places. You can go to uh, databreaches.org, I think it's name, or datalossdb.net, or there's a few out there. So I started perusing some of those, but I ran across, which is, should have been the obvious thing, is uh, human, uh, Health and Human Resources Office of uh, Civil Rights, so HHS OCR, which is where they log all of the HIPAA violations. So it was really interesting. I downloaded that data and I started to peruse it a little bit and, uh, and try to create some analysis of it. You know, what can I figure out from this? And it was fascinating to go through and to learn how to cleanse data, how to classify different types of, um, different types of incidents because it's there, the data is not always there. Sometimes you have to go enrich it from another source or maybe you have to make some inferences, you know, and then adjust your model a little bit. So it's statistically not 100% because you made some inferences. Um, so I did that and it came up with some interesting conclusions, which were at the time, everybody was saying, oh my God, mobile phones are going to kill everybody. Somebody's going to be able to steal all your corporate data off your mobile phones. My thesis was that most of the data on mobile phones is really your own personal data. So the owner of the phone is at most risk, not the corporation that they work for, um, with the exception of potentially email, right? And so uh, I figured health data was gonna be one of those things, particularly for companies who are in the healthcare space, they worry about. And what I found out was that anything that was a mobile device that was part of an incident was usually classified, it was not a mobile device like a phone, it was usually a USB drive. And in many cases it was classified as a, a backup tape or a paper printed copy it was all considered to be a mobile device. I, I don't know if the printed, I think printed paper or something completely different, but whatever. But what it turned out is that there were no mobile phones involved in any HH uh, SOCR incidents, any HIPAA incidents. Um, so I haven't looked in a few years, but just the act of going through that data analysis taught me so much about the supply chain for data, how data is cleaned, how it's used, where all they can go wrong. So for those of you who haven't done any data analytics exercises, figure something out. Um, and go try to try to run your analysis. It, it's super fun exercise. You learn a ton from it, and you might actually become a data scientist, which is one of the fastest growing uh, uh, opportunities in this in this space. So, cool stuff. Cool. Yeah. If no one else has any questions, I one thing that I've been talking to some clients about is cyber insurance and third party risk. What's what's your thoughts about that? Well. I just spoke at the uh, Net Diligence, which is a cyber risk um, conference for insurers in Philly last week. So oh, wow. first time traveling uh, since COVID. So that was kind of fun. It was weird, by the way, to be at the opening, uh, you know, the night before reception 
uh, 200 people all in one room, no masks, about two feet from each other. It was, talk about jumping in with both feet, right? Um, but it was, it was cool to be there. Um, so from a cyber insurance perspective, there's two things, right? Uh, cyber insurance is all, almost all cyber insurers now use a security rating system. Um, in fact, 50% of the uh, policies are underwritten using BitSight data as part of the uh, actuarial or the underwriting process. So, um, so that's kind of interesting. The second thing is that we just released something called financial quantification, which takes all the data from BitSight and then we partnered with Cover, K-O-V-R-R. They do analytics for the insurance uh, industry. And what that does is we can automatically generate effectively a financial um, cost. So think annualized loss expectancy for cyber for cyber incidents, um, which tells you what's your liability, right? So what's your low uh, low probability, your average uh, weighted median, and then your um, top end, right? So it's the you know one percent type of thing. So for example, I just looked at an organization who had. Um, it looked like they had 23, about 23 million in, in weighted average worth of cyber incident costs. So in other words, they were expected to get about three or four different incidents, not all large, right? Some of them were smaller, but um, but overall it was gonna cost them about 23 million per year. That's the, the probability. Um, and their upper end was 300 something million. I wanna say it's 360 million, but I don't remember. It was a lot of money. But what effectively happens in that case is when you look at the weighted uh, medium, Anything that's from zero to the weighted medium, something that you probably want to uh, cover through controls implementation and services and you know whatever it happens to be. So deal with uh, on your own. Anything above that uh, 23 million for that company um, would be best tackled through cyber insurance. Of course, it's sort of a, a moving thing, right? Just because it's a weighted medium, and again, it's probability, doesn't mean that that's where that's you know gospel. Um, you have to take into account the organization's uh, risk appetite. Are they more risk averse? So then you probably want to get $50 million worth of uh, controls in place and then maybe get $400 million worth of cyber insurance um, or vice versa. Maybe they're pretty risk tolerant and they go, okay, we're really going to spend $10 million on cyber initiatives and then we're going to try to cover. We only think we're going to have $100 million. We're going to play the odds. So we're only going to get uh, you know, whatever it costs for cyber insurance. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and by the way, cyber insurers now are not just looking at the overall company. They're starting to dig down because they realize that a large company who has many holdings or many acquisitions are, the acquisitions themselves are often independently operating. So the cyber insurers are now looking at each individual organizational unit and running their, um, their uh, analysis against those. They come up and say, for this one, you've got a really high, uh, high liability. So we're going to really jack you up on the prices and you're going to need 200 million in, in insurance um, and then vice versa. And then they sort of bring it all the way up to the top level. So yeah, got, a quick, got a quick question. Um, have the cyber insurers you work with begun to formulate a method to predict ransomware to their insured companies? They've been working on that for a year and a half, two years. In fact, a lot of the cyber insurers are getting out of the ransomware game. Um, so the big ones are staying in it, you know, Chubb, et cetera, et cetera. They're all, they, they need to, they have to. Uh, but a lot of the smaller players are basically throwing up their hands saying, we're not doing cyber insurance anymore uh, or for ransomware. We'll do it for other things, but that's going to be uh, excluded from the policy. Yeah, and they, by the way, they do use BitSight data for that, a lot of them. Um, I won't speak to specific uh, insurers, but uh, we, we actually have a team that's dedicated to working with cyber insurers providing data, um, financial quantification probably came out of that effort. Uh, I was not involved at the beginning, so I'm not absolutely sure. Um, but yeah, again, we're a source of data. Insurers want all kinds. They've got meteorology, meteorological data. They've got arbor data for you know whether a utility is going to go down. So why not get cyber uh, data from multiple places, including BitSight? So. Yeah, we have a number of customers we've been doing business with who actually bring the BitSight report from, uh, you know, their clients saying, you know, here's your numbers, you got to fix them. So it's it's becoming more and more important for sure. Yeah, cyber insurers actually will give access to their clients uh, to the BitSight portal and say, okay, now we have a common frame of reference to work from. So you can go look at what we're talking about and then fix it. And now, in fact, they can start to collaborate. We've put almost a Slack-like, you know, I, I say that, but you know what I mean, sort of a messaging platform in there. So 
the insurers can talk to their insurance and say, hey, go fix this. And they'll come back and go, okay, we did this. It should be, you know, give us till next week and then blah, blah, blah. It continues on until they've assured themselves that they've uh, covered as many risks as they can. So we're at the top of the hour. We don't have any other questions, but thank you again, of course, Chris, for your great information. Um, don't forget that tomorrow's presentation will be on threat intelligence. So please join us. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Have fun, everyone.